Hi, this is Kathy O'Murray, the Pulpwood Queen, <laughs> singing my way through Girlfriend <laughs> Weekend with Peggy. Anyway, we are here this afternoon for a, a moment of levity because I discovered after Tawana, my faithful uh, <clears throat> executive director for years, had told me about this author's books. Marilyn Simon Rothstein. And if you have not read a Marilyn Simon Rothstein book during this time of COVID, COVID and distress and storms, and you need to read her books because you will laugh so hard, lift and separate, crazy to leave you. And now we have this new dramedy that is actually being released to the world today during Girlfriend Weekend. So I am pleased to introduce my Avon, Connecticut friend, Marilyn. So Marilyn, take it away. Hi, Kathy. And hi, everybody who I met last year at, in South Carolina. And then we met in Jefferson, Texas. And it was such a party. Yes, so, it was. So lucky to be invited back by Kathy. <laughs> Uh, you know, I I've kind of keep you as the comedy relief for any time I need. Um, you know, we all need a good laugh, and nobody makes me laugh harder than Marilyn. I can't believe some of the things she posts sometimes. So, anyway, she's here, and she will also make you hungrier than you've ever been in your life, especially after reading about the blueberry fritter in the, mm -hmm. her last book. So, please begin away. Well. Um... I got started writing when I was first, my first book was published when I was 63 years old. Yoo-hoo! And now I'm 30. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, it was quite a journey. I've always been a writer. I wrote uh, for a living my whole life. I was in advertising. And, but I really, what I always wanted to do was not just write a novel, novel but publish a novel. And my first novel was Lift and Separate. And that was followed by Husbands and Other Sharp Objects. Oh, yes. yes. Followed by, oh, look, I happen to have it here. Isn't that amazing how I happen to have it here? Yeah, <laughs> crazy yeah. to leave you. And now yesterday, in preparation, being with Kathy, I was keeping my um, the name of my new book under wraps. But I released it yesterday. And it's um, Who Loves You Best? Give the best titles, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barbara. Amen. You have the best books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. We're excited about this new dramedy. Mm -hmm. And do tell, do tell. Okay, so it is a story of a woman who lives, her name is Jody. She lives in Florida with her husband, where she owns a podiatric um, practice. And her remorse is that her granddaughter lives in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. So most of her relationships with um, the granddaughter, whose name is McAllen, she was named after the scotch her parents were drinking the night she was conceived. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Jody and her husband, Jake, their, their remorse is that they are so far away from their grandchild, which, you know, so many people today mm -hmm. are in that position. Um, lucky for me, my daughter just moved one town over, so now I can never get out of here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but poor Jody. So Jody feels like her daughter doesn't invite her there enough, and you know she doesn't see the kid, and they're really tired of talking to kid on FaceTime. And her daughter invites her to come and babysit for a week while her daughter, who's a successful owner of a restaurant, goes to Boston on business. Well, she gets there and there are already two other grandmas in town and her daughter's marriage is in shambles. So that could be a very sad situation, except I wrote it, so it's just funny. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, I just enjoy making fun of all of the things that um, happen to us because to me, laughter is the best medicine. It mm -hmm. is. It truly And it's is. coming out in late fall from Lake Union. Yay. Good for you. And it's not, and I put the name up yesterday, Kathy, and people were hitting Amazon and not finding it. And that's because it's not up yet. <laughs> oh, no. Well, it'll be up soon. 
I hope. I hope so. <laughs> yep, that's good. <clears throat> so anyway, and so the but I'm also seeing that you put up all these posts and there's people are liking the title very very yeah, much. I'm so excited because that title is a long time coming. <laughs> no, I don't think it's what you told me at first. No, you the original, I'll tell you, the original name of the book was The Battle of the Boobies. And for those who don't know what a booby is, a booby is Yiddish Grandma. for grandma. Okay. I like, actually I love would be a booby, but I don't want to be called a booby because a booby is usually old and, you know, it's an old name for a grandma. A crone. You know, I right. hate that word, crone. Uh, yeah. It's so cougar. so so that was originally named the Battle of the Boobies. And then I thought, nah, too many people <laughs> won't know what a booby is and they'll think it's the Battle of the Boobies. That's what they would <laughs> with, You know, Which let's separate. separate. <laughs> let's separate. Yeah, I'm like, I went far <laughs> enough with the bras. <laughs> Kathy called me up and said, how about if when we interview, we both wear pink, hot pink bras over our shirts? And I said, nope, but if you want to do it, just hold up my book. <laughs> I bowed out myself. I couldn't get one I to fit over my sweater. chicken. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you know, it's all because of Lift and Separate, which is, tell mm -hmm. them the premise of that book real quick. Uh, the premise of that book, is, that was my first book, and it's about a um, woman who has this long marriage, three grown children, gave up her career to be in the husband's business, so now we've got her problem, because he then finds a 22-year-old uh, Argentinian model and leaves her, but it's lift and separate because he owns a bra empire, <laughs> so... Literally, she's got to lift and separate from this guy <laughs> who owns the bra empire. Brilliant. And, um, I want just want you to know that um, she does. She does very well. She did so well. I wrote another book about her. Yep, you sure did. So. And in this, the other book, Husbands and Other Sharp Objects, um, her name is Marcy. And Marcy is trying to separate from the owner of the bra empire while her daughter is engaged to marry his lawyer. <laughs> They're always so complicated. And yeah, but isn't but, life complicated? Listen, if yeah. you all knew mine right now, you would go, oh, you should write about that. No way. No yeah. way I'm not going <laughs> to tell this story. So keep going. Keep it's like going. when people say you can't make it up. Yeah. Because it's because so far you're... afield. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't, I, you know, I think about all the author stories that people tell me or who they're related to or what, and I go, oh my gosh, you can't make this stuff up. Mm -hmm. And why is it if it's nonfiction, they think you're telling the real story. And if it's fiction, they go, you're lying. I mean, if you're <laughs> nonfiction, they're going, you made that, you really made that. Right. Up, you know? But if it's fiction, know. they think that it really happened to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Like when Lift and Separate came out, I had a client from my advertising business. I had the account for almost 25 years. She sold out. I went on to write books. And she called me. I hadn't spoken to her in four years. And she said, I saw the book. I read the book. I'm so happy for you. I knew it was your life dream to have a book published. She says, but I'm so sad about what happened to you and your husband. <laughs> And your husband was with you at Girlfriend Weekend last year. Oh, yeah, he goes everywhere. I, I don't know what he <laughs> actually thinks about all of this, but um, I, he looked like he was having a good time. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he's like my, you know, Joan Rivers used to beat up on the husband. Yeah. So that's why I bring him along. So I, you know, make jokes while he's in the room. <laughs> he seems to take them well. Well, yeah. we were in Miami at the, um, I was speaking in Miami and you know, he had gone on this little tour with me and we get to Miami. No one's ever said anything to him beyond hello. OK, um, so this woman, they say, do you have any as I'm on the stage, my husband's all the way in the back of this giant room. All of a sudden, this woman stands up and goes, I don't have a question for Marilyn. I have a question for her husband. And I see my husband go like, what? And he goes, well, what's your question? And she said, um, I want to know what it's like living with Marilyn. And my husband <laughs> looked at her and said, 
who's Marilyn? <laughs> <laughs> and I was on the stage. <laughs> well, Lacey was there. He did good. I thought he did good. <laughs> he, I, was at the, I was at the Tennessee Williams uh, Literary Festival and I was introduced as the closing speaker and they go, and her husband's here with her. And he announced his name and he didn't come. I <laughs> talk about embarrassing. And he was watching a football game. He said, oh, I've heard it. I've heard it before. We're no longer married. <laughs> he's permanently not here now. No, he's gone <laughs> with the wind. I won't yeah. introduce him. I won't introduce him. Okay. Okay. Gone with the wind. Oh, and we've got our singing author. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Can you come to all my events and just ramble, you know, oh. just, yeah. Anytime you see a moment, <laughs> just sing it out. Okay. Okay. Go Marilyn. Um, well, I had something I want to share with you because, you know, it took me a long time to become an author, like a lifetime. I mean, I had written books, but I didn't realize, I guess the important thing to say to anybody who's new at this is that writing the book's the easy part. Mm -hmm. And the really tough part is getting it published and then marketing it. Right. And um, that takes a lot of energy. So I had written a few books and, um, you know, they wound up in drawers, which you can't believe. But if you put a manuscript in a drawer, it hardly ever gets published. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that, right, Barbara? Barbara. <laughs> you put it in the drawer and it's like okay <laughs> so bye bye gone with the wind yeah. so i just finally decided after of course i have to make the story that i had medical problems um that i really what i wanted to do in life was just get a book published um i wanted to be a published author so i worked really hard on a book took almost 10 years, went to a lot of workshops and um, finally got it published. And from this, I have learned so much about being an author that I made a list to share with everybody here. Oh, good. Okay, get your so get your pen. I wish I didn't have to hold it up, but my memory is shot to hell. Well, I, she sent it to me and it's very enlightening. Okay. Number one, who's got a pencil out there? Yeah, they do. Okay. Okay. One, you can read your manuscript a million times. It will still have a typo in it when it is published. Mm -hmm. And three months later, a reader will call out your mistake on social media as Ooh. if you could do something about it. It's so true. And they go, you right? might want to get an editor, right? Oh. So I had a woman uh, point out my mistake. I wrote back, thank you, because what am I going to write? <laughs> Two days later, she writes back, did you get it changed? Oh, oh my God. Like, what does she have, a dog in this race or something? <laughs> Marilyn, you have to get a time machine, babe. <laughs> get in that time machine. Go in the Wayback Machine. Go you back. know, I didn't, even, Barbara, I didn't even put like, there's nothing I can do, but I just wrote, thank you for letting me know. I let those go. I don't, I don't touch okay. those. See, you're, you're smarter than me. Well, I don't have to <laughs> no, do cause, that. No, because I'm smarter because I know it's best that I just keep my mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> There's no one that person in there that's like, if you had an editor or if you yeah. ever yeah. read this. Yeah. Well, like, you know, how many you proofread? I proofread my last book so much that the last proofread, I asked a friend to proofread it. Because I didn't think I could possibly even. My, hus it. my husband's doing mine right now before I hit send in two weeks. He's I'm going to send him mine. <laughs> I mean, you just send <laughs> your own story. I do. Okay, number two. Who's got a pencil? Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks they can write a book. Yeah. Right? Or run a great restaurant. <laughs> or do both at the same time. That's true. Number three. Nine out of 10 authors call themselves best-selling. <laughs> the rest are award-winning. <laughs> I saw an announcement last week. There were three authors speaking in conversation and it literally said, best-selling author Mary Jane will be speaking to best-selling author Susie Green, who will be talking to best-selling author Jane Doe. So if you're not best-selling, just claim you're award-winning. Yeah, there you go. 
<laughs> or a queen. Or a queen. Or a public you, queen book club see, selection. There you go. If you see someone on the beach with your book, take a picture. If you see no one at the beach with your book, give the book to two women and ask if you can take a picture. <laughs> I'm not going to claim I ever did that. I just am making a suggestion. That's how you got George Clooney and Brad Pitt to be reading your book. George Clo George Clooney loves my book. So does Robert. And Reddy. even Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa likes my book. That's why she's smiling. So, <laughs> number five. Ignore every author on social media who claims to write a book a year while caring for three small children and maintaining a full time job as a brain surgeon. <laughs> We've all seen those people, okay? How was like my kids are grown, they're out of the house, okay? I don't have another job like that I do all day and then I come here and write, okay? This writing is my job. But then I'll always see these people who like, like they have all these children and they're a lawyer and they're a doctor and they're, and it's like, they make they're, me feel so bad. So I've just decided I ignore them. What, Barb? <laughs> An Instagram influencer. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, they're an influence, and they're dating George Clooney. <laughs> what annoys me. Okay, six. Every writer was once a lawyer. Every lawyer wants to be a writer. If you guys look at how many lawyers are writers, <laughs> look, at, look in the bios. It will just blow your mind. Number seven. If you enjoy math, count the people at a party who ask if you would like your book to be a movie. <laughs> Everywhere I go, people go, wouldn't it be great if your book was a movie? And it's like, I feel like, do you know Steven Spielberg? Because here's the book. <laughs> it's like as if this is the easiest thing what? to do. Or you never thought of it. it yes. never oh my God. You came and said that to me. I never would have thought it. <laughs> oh my God, I got the whole thing casted, but I never thought about it. Okay. Yeah. Wasn't one of your shows going to be a Broadway play, Barb? Yes, I just, as a matter of fact, yes. And I just got a thing. They're ready to deliver three songs and three scenes very shortly. Oh, wow. <gasps> oh, yay. Wow. Great. Oh, happy endings. <gasps> oh, will be a Broadway right. musical. You heard it live here. Yeah. Girlfriend Weekend. Awesome. Okay. Okay. <laughs> number eight. Don't be upset when your daughter tells you she has three more pages to the end of your novel, but she'll finish it tomorrow. <laughs> that literally happened to me. Okay. At least she read it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. I'll think of it that way, Kathy. Yeah. And here's number 10. When speaking to a large group, any joke about writing that mentions liquor will get a laugh. <laughs> This is foolproof. It okay. is. So you go speak somewhere, start with a liquor joke, and you're off. <laughs> it's so I don't true. know why people want to laugh at that liquor, but they do. Uh, it's so true. When I had my sec uh, first book club meeting, um, six complete strangers showed up. And, um, you know, I had wine and cheese and, you know, and um, one woman timidly raised her hand and she said i don't know a pulpwood queen wearing a tiara i mean i don't think i could do that i'd have to leave my house with wearing a pul and i said oh it's it's lovely to meet you let me give you some more wine and everybody laughed their head off about that and i use it word. every time i do a speaking engagement and they always laugh have some more wine and they just it is foolproof it is foolproof. Full Remember it's, this. It's everybody. unbelievable. Yeah. It's like, you know, even on Zoom, like I've done a lot of Zoom ones and I hate Zoom because you can't see if anyone's laughing, which is why all the comedians didn't go on during COVID. And you can't see what they're really drinking either. So you can't <laughs> tell. Everybody's got one of those. Where's mine? Well, I, I just bring my wine glass. I'm not shy. You know um, what I'm drinking. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> but but um, you can't tell if anybody's laughing. So I'm on with this group in Jersey. And it's like the middle of COVID and I trying to be funny and they're sitting there like this, the whole room. Yeah. I, then I said a joke about oh, gin because that's what my husband drinks. And I see them all smiling. Wait, wait a minute. So 
It's foolproof. Yeah. What was the joke? It's a hundred percent foolproof. Oh, it's very easy. I don't remember the joke, but my husband is a big gin drinker, so there's always something I can come up with. <laughs> oh man, that's great. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's fun. That's why I can't ever have a girlfriend weekend where it's um, you know, they don't serve alcohol <laughs> because nobody would come. Right. <laughs> Live ones have to be. I had a beautiful facility near me that could house 220 people in it on a lake, a resort. And they said, but no alcohol. And I go, bye. <laughs> Wasn't gonna yeah, happen. That's not going to work. No. And you guys, this is coffee. It's not. It's coffee. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. anyway, well, well, we're learning a lot of things. Yeah. Is, what is what are some of the best tidbits you've had uh, by doing speaking engagements? Because you're everywhere. Um, well, you know, one thing that is totally amazing that I would have never thought of coming from the advertising business mm -hmm. is that um, other authors are so nice. I mean, yeah. it is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'm I always think the worst of everything. So, of course, I expect everyone to be mean. And then people start calling you up. I heard you're going to be in town. I would like to meet you in person. It's like, what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> at Pulpwood, I mean, I the first time I went, I didn't know anybody. You know, I said I knew Bar I knew who Barbara was because, you mm -hmm. know, she's best she's best selling for real. Half a million books, right? A half a million? Half a, half a million of, of uh, Keeper of Happy Endings. Yeah. Yeah, just oh. one book. Wow, that's awesome. But we bonded, we bonded over vodka. Marilyn oh, there you I, go. The yes. Person. I taught her about Chirac vodka. Yeah, we had a little vodka. You were very sick, though, I remember. Oh, I was so sick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe it wasn't the vodka. And Barbara nope. and I were on the panel with um, hair. Well, the hair Susan panel Peterson. where you did Susan's hair. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That was and um, so what was I telling you? What did you ask me? I'm... I was saying anything on the road that happened that you, you know, just. Oh, okay. Really the first out. thing is, I, you know, I've just found other authors. Now, I mostly know women authors. Right. <laughs> um, but um, that may be because I was always the kind of person who always had a lot of girlfriends and no one asked me out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Bonding. That could be uh, a remnant of that. Of all the Saturday nights I sat home. Yes. But. Um, I was always available. Remember how Miss Erica Pageant would always be on Saturday night? Uh, I watched it every year. And I, I never had a conflict. Never. <laughs> never. In fact, I sat in a New York, in the Mayflower Hotel in New York City with my fellow rep friend, Angie Smits, and mm -hmm. watched the Miss America Pageant. We sat on the end of each bed eating <laughs> junk food and drinking beer. And our whole goal was to make fun of every single person <laughs> Every <laughs> single one. Exactly. You know, I'm I'm in New York, I'm telling you, it was so much fun. I was a, back when I was a book rep. So anyway, I had um, a girlfriend that used to hand out dart guns and watch the watch that show, and they could, it, they didn't like somebody, they'd shoot the dart at them. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's the Miss America watching party. I mean, there, how many? Know. Raise your hand well, if you like are Miss Oscar America party. watching. Yeah, you watch, I always. Yeah, I never I miss it. Always. Always. And I, and I, have, I have three sisters. This yeah. three of us. So I didn't even have to invite a friend over. We could just, the three of us, sit there and be mean. <laughs> There she is. That's, you know, and it's you know, America. It takes a, thank you, Peggy. <laughs> you know, and you know, I'm embarrassed about that now because I can't even imagine. If you read my book, you'll read the story about when my mom put me in the Miss Eureka pageant. <laughs> and well, I'll just tell you because it was a <laughs> catastrophe, fiasco, <laughs> debacle, whatever. How but old I, were you? How old were you? Uh, I think barely 15. And it was usually the senior girls in high school. I was a sophomore, but I, you know, I graduated from high school at 17. So I was tall and I actually would have had a good figure if I'd had a waist, but I'm built just like a boy straight up and down with boots. And so uh, I had an empire purple lavender dress mm -hmm. 
And you know, those legs, the eggs, legs, mm -hmm. suntan pantyhose with my purple clunky buckled shoes and you know my hair in hot rollers and i had to walk down the courthouse uh hallway in front of all these jerks that were the men of the businessmen of town you know the insurance company guy the banker you know those guys and when i walked by they was reading off my attributes which not that i was a good i student. thought you were going to say they were reading off my ass <laughs> Sorry. Well, they may have been, but they, but anyway, I'm walking along. I'm thinking I look pretty cute, you know, and they were reading off about, you know, as in every club you can be in, in high school, French club, science club, everything. And they said, and her measurements are 36, 34, 36. And they started laughing hard. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. And, you know, when you're just barely 15 and somebody's uh -huh. make, laughing because of your waist size, um, you know, it was pretty. And I just smiled to beat the band, you know, and put on my good acting face. But I was devastated. And, of course, the the beautiful beauty queen senior, Sue Kennedy, won. And she deserved it. She was gorgeous and beautiful. But how many of you had mothers force, force you in a beauty pageant? Now, I was, was in ugly. one, but my mom didn't have to force me. No. You I, wanted to be in it? I wanted to be in everything. That, no. That's me. No. What yeah. was the first pageant called? It was the it was the Miss Teen Dallas pageant. And I was oh, about 15. Wow, big time. And I, I made the 25 finalists and I sang, I enjoy being a girl. That was my song. Of course you did. I <laughs> of love course. it. Are you, are you surprised? You, <laughs> no, but you know, Fanny Flagg and I had a wonderful conversation, you know, because she was in the um, uh, Miss um, Alabama pageant like five times and always got never won. But she said, you know, she was always in it, had the, and she said, I was a beauty queen, you know. And I, I go, well, how was that for you? And she goes, well, you know, it got me on TV, yeah. you know, she got her, her acting start and she was such a comedian. She's delightful, but we used to share stories um, whenever I'd talk to her. She's a She was at the Oscars when Bobby and I were there because she had, that was the year of fried green tomatoes. Fried green tomatoes. She had yeah. a table right there in front. I did a, a, a beauty in the book show with her and she's hilarious. She's uh -huh. like Marilyn, but she turned to me and she, you know, on a break when we were doing this shoot with this book club and she goes, you know, Kathy, I'm a reader just like you. And she goes, I guess us Southern girls all like to read, except I'm from Kansas. But I go, mm. and she goes, I'm going to bet you're a Methodist. And I said, oh, my God, I am a Methodist. And she goes, me too. She goes, I'm president of the Rotary International Club. And I go, oh, my God, I'm president of the Jefferson Rotary International Club. And we laughed. Until tears were streaming down our false, we had a makeup artist who did false eyelashes on us, and neither one of us are false eyelash kind of girls. And we, I've never laughed so hard with anybody in my life, kind of like Marilyn. And that's why I like to be around her so I much. Guess, Kathy, I want to tell you that my mother didn't make me go into any pageants because yeah. my family, they thought anything good that happened to you was going to bring bad luck. So they wouldn't want what? me winning anything. Yeah, like if, if something good happened, you, my sister had an internship at the Wall Street Journal when she was like 16. She oh my had three God. articles on the front page and my parents wouldn't tell anybody about it because they thought it was going to bring, like, you know, you're, you're bragging. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's why I, that and I was ugly. But <laughs> had I been in a contest, I was from Flushing, Queens. So I would have been Miss Teen Flushing. <laughs> Think on that. It just occurred to me when you said Miss Teen Jefferson. I would have been Miss Teen Flushing. It was Miss, it was Miss Eureka. Which oh, means, Lordy. Which Caroline, I feel well, that Flushing is pretty good. Yeah, no, <laughs> Flushing is an address. Well, at least, you know, that, David I will never move down the rest of my life. Flushing's actually very nice. David <laughs> Valdez. You should have named it something else. <laughs> he's he's one of my authors and he's a playwright in New York and, and does wonderful things. And he wrote his first book was The Rhinestone Queen. And he did a whole 
short <laughs> story collection about all the beauty queens in the South that he went to all the pageants. And the funniest one was the Miss Toad Suck. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, because I picked his book, was invited to the Toad Suck Festival <laughs> to be oh, T O E. Oh, is that T O E or T O A D? Is it toad, toad suck or suck. toad suck? Toad, but I mean, toad toad suck. suck. And I went and I took some Pulpwood <laughs> Queens with me. And you won't believe it. My book signing got canceled because a tornado hit the town. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what my hometown mascot is? The Eureka Tornadoes. <laughs> <laughs> See all these connections. I mean, they're just absolutely phenomenal. But I'll tell you, when Marilyn came on the first time, I laughed so hard, I almost peed my pants. But I there's a television show that was on, and it was called Mrs. Maisel. Has anybody oh, seen yeah. it? I, oh, yeah. I watched ever about this girl who becomes a stand-up comedian. You know, about the time that Joan Rivers first got mm -hmm. her start, Phyllis Diller and everything, she's, you know, it's in the past. And they did a call out saying they were looking for female comedians to be on the show. And I must have sent that to Marilyn. I don't know how many times that you've got to go yeah. try out for that show. Because you know what? Whenever I, when I, when I go to speak, because most people don't, you know, most people go and talk about their books. People don't expect it to be sort of like a comedy routine. Right. So they're surprised. Okay. So every time I speak, someone will come up to me and go, right. you know, you should be a stand up comedian. I know. And what I say is I don't like to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> sending me that i know i can't yes, I know. I so i said we'll come back to girlfriend weekend and we'll run this panel last year i had them all dress up and what was our what were we doing what what do oh, we do we were supposed to be doing three women sitting in a beauty salon and somehow oh. we were about our boot books yeah and you guys were all dressed in leopard and my hair were you doing my hair then or no, my hair? it was a wig oh yeah Okay. And you can't back comb a wig because it okay. comes. Listen, the Susan Peterson thing was like a hundred out of a 10 point rating. Oh my God, that was hilarious. Okay. So but last year, me getting my wig done. <laughs> well, I will, uh, for all of you, I will post a picture of that or somebody share it. I will post a picture on the, the, the Pulp of Queen Presents website tomorrow. And I think I've got a picture of us all dressed in leopard print too, somewhere. Oh, was, um, you know what? The, I don't know how many people here have never gone live to Mona Kathy. I got to say this because, you know, 24 years. If you've never been to one of these things live, you can't even like imagine. Like I came home from the first one. I must have been talking about it for four months. I'd never been to anything like that. Hmm. Um, well, that's, that's, I created the book festival that I thought everybody wanted would want to go to the party I most want to go to is the one where we have fun. I go to these things and they say, you're going to speak for 15 minutes. You'll sign books for 10 and then you're free. And, you know, and it's on some big campus or capital ground somewhere. And then you're turned free. And then, and then what do you do? You look for somebody to hang out with. Yeah, well, you could drink, but I usually <laughs> find some author, Pulp of Queen author to hang out with, but I go, that's dumb. You've got us all there as captured audience. Let's have a party. And so I started, I played dress up when I was a kid. You read my book, you'll know why. I had these really good looking boys that lived across the street in a dorm because we had an all a men's business college in my hometown that brought in these gorgeous guys from all over the world in every nationality to get their grades up or their language up before they went to an Ivy League college. It was the Babson Institute. And they lived across the street from my home. So when I was kids, my sisters and I would put my mom's old prom gowns on and we'd traipse across the St. Nicholas Street and knock on the door and the house mother would answer, Mrs. Baker. And we'd say, can the boys come out and play? Now these were college boys. Okay? <laughs> 
And so they say, just a minute, Rudy, Mike. And all these guys would come bounding down in suits. It was like, did anybody play a mystery date? Remember the cool guy in the tux? Does these guys look like New York City, you know? Oh, and they come bounding down from Venezuela and Japan and all these places, and they were wow. handsome. And they go, would you girls like to watch us play football? And so we'd get on the veranda, the porch, and they just toss the ball back, and they'd take off their shirts. <laughs> and, I mean, we were like five, three, and two. Oh, how cute. And they carried us around, and then – my mother, who was the beauty queen, would come out to wash the car, and then they'd all come over and want to help her in her bikini. So, uh, you know, those seeds were planted in my life, you know. And so uh, when I see somebody funny like Marilyn, I want to be with her all the time. Oh, yeah. I really when I see somebody handsome like Dana, I want to be with him all the time because he tells me all those beautiful boys that went to college there. But um you know, you'll you'll just have to read my book. In fact, it's banned. Did you guys hear? <laughs> it's banned. Don't read it because, oh, I was going to put that up last night. I'm going to put up a post on Monday and I'm going to say, after 2024 Girlfriend Weekend, all of my 2024 books are banned. Do We're not really read got out. Here's the list. <laughs> Let's see what happens. What's the worst thing that could happen? I put, I put last night, I put out the Keeper of Happy Ending, no, the Echo of Old Books, and I, because there was a post, it was just begging to be answered about Nikki Haley wanting to ban books. She said, we're just getting started. If you're upset now, just wait, we're just getting started. So I just put a thing out and I said, screw that, pretty please ban my book. And I put the cover out <laughs> and hashtag ban my book. And it's on Twitter right now. <laughs> well, I'm going to, if you guys want the stamp, Mm -hmm. The stamp, if you don't have the stamp, uh, email me and I'll send it to you. And Monday, let's just, let's hit it hard. Let's just say, all these books are banned. You cannot read them. Take that, Florida. <laughs> oh, Mr. <laughs> governor San Ron Santos or whatever his name is. I just cannot believe a governor would ban reading. I mean, the, the Webster here. Huh? The dictionary. The dictionary. The dictionary. The dictionary okay, okay. is so the dictionary 1,500 the books. I have to tell you, Jimmy Kimmel was talking about that the other night. And uh -huh. he said, actually, they're also going to um, change the title of the dictionary. They're just going to call it a shenary. <laughs> you get it? <laughs> we moved the first half of the Just subtract the first word. Yeah. Uh, that's so funny. What? Oh, my gosh, you guys. <laughs> this world has gone nuts. And I, I, I'll tell you, I have always done things outside the box. When you read what I wore to school in the fourth grade, you'll understand my outfits. I was made fun of pretty much my whole life, but I didn't care because I was going to be an artist when I grew up. And artists always dress, you know, different. Yeah. And I had a young man who was a college student that, um, that lived catty corner from us <clears throat> named James Brothers. And his wife was my sister's student teacher. And she was six foot tall. She had platinum blonde hair and she wore mini skirts in lime green and hot pink. And she had legs that were model and she, and she was hot and he was cool. And James went on to run uh, the art department of the University of Kansas. And my mom took art lessons from him. And um, he ended up, he, he, I think his first commission for Washington, D.C., Dana, was for a bronze for the memorial, one of the memorials. It was 500000 So wow. he did really well. And so I thought, I'm going to be like Jim Brothers. You know, and uh, my funniest story is that when I went home, my best friend, who was Miss Manhattan K State, <laughs> a, be a real beauty queen, she said, We need to take your book and your tiara and t shirt down to the museum. You're our only published author. So I said, Oh, <laughs> no, the Greenwood County, no. She goes, Jim Brothers is in there. You need to be in there, and you're an artist. You need to take. So we went down. And we took my very first tiara, which was important to me, and a T-shirt, a hot pink T-shirt, and my book. And I signed it to the, and they said, well, 
she goes, I know that Kathy, Jim Brothers is in here and Kathy's our first published author. So could you put her book in the glass case? So the next year I went back to visit her and she goes, let's go see where it is. And I go, oh, no, no. We go into the library and we walk around. We don't say anything. I mean, the museum and there's there's Jim Brothers bronze sculpture, but there's no tiara, no. So she goes to the counter. She goes, excuse me, Nina or whatever her name is. She said, I'm here back with Kathy, our only published author of the county. And can you tell me where her, the objects she donated to the library are? She goes, um, uh, you know, just a minute. She ran to the back of the room and she came out she, and a man was with her. And he said, well, um, we uh, sold them. I, she goes, I'm sorry, did you say you sold them? She goes, yeah, somebody came in one to buy them, so we sold them because we really didn't have room. <laughs> I, oh, and I, I, you know, that is a very humbling experience to grow up in a hometown that you've just written about, about how the wonderful teachers and the librarians, and I gave books to the library. They sold those too. <gasps> yeah. Oh. Yeah, so uh, I, when my second book came out, I did not go to the museum or the library. I went to the Kansas Book uh, Library, uh, Kansas um, Center for the Book Librarian Luncheon as the keynote speaker, and the Texas Library Association closing speaker in Texas. So, you know, I've just learned that, um, you know, if you want to be humble, um, humbled you know toot your own horn you will be knocked to your knees <laughs> we have a song for that peggy uh okay toot, toot, tootsie goodbye <laughs> toot, tootsie don't cry that's the closest as i can get to toot that's great that's <laughs> absolutely great Wait so a minute. i have to go back to something you said my favorite singer in this group you said something about when i was at the oscars yes, yes. and then you kept going what what that there <laughs> okay, so here, here's my picture. Can y'all see that? My picture from it? Uh, back it up Masters. a little bit. Back it up. It's it's not showing for some reason. Take a picture and, and put it on my Pulpit Queen page. I'll, I'll post it. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm wearing the same dress today, but I barely fit in it, and I don't know if I can get out of it. But the name <laughs> of my chapter in my book, Howdy Hollywood, about Oscars, uh, is called, Oh, I'd Like to Be an Oscar-Hired Singer. <laughs> <laughs> so the story of it, very quickly, because I know we've got to move on, is is that I was, a, I was the demo singer for Marilyn and Alan Bergman, and therefore for Johnny Mandel and for you know, and, and every, every um, songwriter I, I ever admired. Are you going to sing I, the way we were now? I can She's going to sing at the we awards. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but um, the first song I did for them was How Do You Keep the Music Playing? And my partner was Bruce Hornsby before he got famous. Mm -hmm. oh so anyway, the, I, I got to be friends with them. And actually, Alan Bergman actually endorsed my book. I mean, I'm still friends with him. Um, and so I got chummy with them. And so on one of the sessions I did for them one time in 1987, I said, hey, if you guys ever have a party, I'm married to a really fine piano player. It used to be Lou Rawls's piano player. And my husband had his own career. I said, my husband and I do all these fancy parties. I was thinking at their house, you know, with Barbara Streisand and Robert <laughs> Redford, you know, around their piano, just kind of singing along with me, you know, and saying, oh, you're gorgeous, you're gorgeous. <laughs> so that's all I, I that's as far as I was thinking I didn't know that they were actually on the board of governors for the Oscars so a month later when I'm in the hospital having a babe my first baby my husband comes and says well you got your phone call today from the Bergmans they're giving us a party and I'm like well okay when's it gonna be because I'm having a baby right now they said it don't you don't need to worry about that it's a couple of months from now and then my husband said I don't want to do it I, I couldn't do it without him. He does the orchestra part of it. I'm just the singer part of it. Right. So, so that's what started it. We ended up doing it and we did well. And we had that account for three or four years. We did the what's called the governor's ball. And that's, I've, I've heard of that the is the party ball. that everybody comes to when they leave the the awards they go right they go straight into the governor's ball so you see everybody i saw everybody i ever wanted to see in hollywood i kept the so list who's really ones. uglier in person than they are not in person 
Who was I could have said who's better was, looking, but that would be positive. Uh, well, Streisand was shorter than I thought she would. I didn't She's know she little. was so tiny. She's kind of tiny. Really? Um, but, um, you know, I I just remember, just I'm like Kathy. I remember the gorgeous men. Like Warren Beatty was gorgeous. You know, Kevin Costner was right next to the stage. He was Ooh. gorgeous. Patrick Swayze. I mean, oh. I was just drooling all night. I mean, I have a handsome husband too, so I, I I didn't have to worry about that. But but it was it was just fun. I'm just such a I'm, you know, I love Hollywood so much. I was just kind of a geek about that. That it was yeah. just so fun to see everybody. Audrey Hepburn was at one of them. Madonna and I would get there early because I'd have to get there early to set up, and so I'd sneak into where they were doing the rehearsals and stuff. I heard Madonna rehearsing, and you know, like a private concert. I saw Cher backstage running around and it was fun, fun yeah. times. So cool. So Marilyn, you go to New York all the time. What's your right. big celebrity uh, sighting? Okay, okay, Nicole Kidman was my big one. I'll tell you the story. Okay. Have you got time for me to tell this? It'll take a few seconds. Yeah. Okay, so my, my kids are young. They're like 10 and five. Now they're 80 and 90, but then they were 10 <laughs> and five. And, uh, we go to a place that's called Serendipity. If you're ever in New York, it's a very small place. The thing they're famous for is called frozen hot chocolate. Mm -hmm. They freeze hot chocolate and then they layer it with whipped cream and it's to die for. They also do hamburgers and stuff. And of course it's very reasonably priced. The hamburger is about $700. <laughs> and um, so we go in me and Alan and the two kids and who walks in and sits at the table next to us, but Nicole Kidman, Tom Cruise, and their two children. Oh. At the time, Nicole Kidman was in a play on Broadway where she appeared nude. Oh, okay. yeah. I remember that. So they walk in, and of course, like the entire, it's not a big restaurant. Everybody can see them, and everybody's like, you know, either they're like this or they're pretending they don't notice that that's Tom Cruise. <clears throat> anyway, we were within earshot, and the waiter came and my daughter, 10 years old, she goes to me, I wonder what you order when you're nude on Broadway in a place that's famous for frozen hot chocolate. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Tom orders his hamburger and some other, you know, they have these big Sundays. The two kids order hamburgers and the desserts and they get to know, Pil no, they get to Nicole Kim and she said, I'll have a cup of tea. <laughs> of course she did. Of course she that did. That answers the question. Oh, that was no, my no. best celebrity sighting. That's a good and one. I got to overhear the whole family thing going on. And the other thing that was really interesting is there was a man at the next <laughs> table who did magic tricks. You know, like, he wasn't a magician. He just was a guy. And yeah. he went up to Tom Cruise and said, thank you for all your great movies. I'd love to do a magic trick for you. The entire time, and and Tom Cruise is making all this inroads with the guy, right? Like talking and kidding with the kids. Nicole is sitting there like this. <laughs> so my daughter said, she's so cold. I go, well, how would you be if all you had was tea for 10 months? <laughs> <laughs> or you were married to a Scientologist. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we know what happened to that, that marriage. So. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that was my best. That was my best one. Oh, my. I have lots of them, but I have to tell you my favorite celebrity sightings is right here today. Oh. I'm serious. I, I mean it. I would rather be with real people writing real stories. Yeah. But I, I I told my agent, Marley Russoff, that I wanted to write a book about all the celebrities I've run into, literally run into. And she goes, nobody would want to read that. And I go, I don't know. Everywhere I go, I tell those stories and they go, you've got to write that down. And I go, well, one day I will, because it's, I've had some pretty funny incidents where I've run into some, I was walking with, Ed Woods, who, not the movie, uh, Ed Woods was one of the partners in um, the um, Southern Territories that I used to work for as a book rep. And he's a tall, bald man that wore black suits, black overcoat, and smoked a cigar. And he's, he's very tall and imposing. And I was walking with him in front of Donald Trump's 
you know, tower. And um, a jogger comes running by and I look over and it was Sandra Bullock jogging by with a ponytail. And she gets, I kind of turn around and she starts jogging backwards and she, she's jog, jogging in place. She goes, how are you doing today? He goes, I'm doing great. How are you doing? And she goes, great. Good to see you. And I said, do you know Sandra Bullock when she left? He goes, I have no idea. I've <laughs> never met her before in my life. But he looked kind of famous, you know, because he had this, he was tall and imposing and he looked very New York. And um, I was with him another time when I ran smack dab into Donald Sutherland and we about knocked each other down going in a deli. So, you know, I've had crazy things happen. He was real nice. Oh, hi, so you just never know. Huh? I'm going to hear an Adam Lambert meet the celebrity story. Yes, tell the story. So some of you know, Adam Lambert is my stepson. So when he was about 10, 12 years old, um, his dad took him to New York to see some Broadway shows, which as if you knew Adam Lambert, that's an amazing thing. <laughs> so he ran across the street to the hotel, from the hotel to the Starbucks one morning, Adam did. And uh, he was standing in line and uh, he was a huge fan of Waiting for Guffman and all the Christopher Guest movies. Oh, Christopher Guest? Yeah, right? me too. No, and he was Parker Posey. And oh, was, uh, Parker Posey, Texas. Parker, yeah. Parker Posey. <laughs> And she turned around and she goes, how old are you? Because <laughs> he's a kid. But he just loved all the Christopher Guest movies. So. Well, I love Waiting for Guffman. That's one of my favorite films of all time. Yeah. Will you tell Adam something for me? Before that movie came out about Elvis that was so great last year, I I always thought that Adam should have played Elvis. He looks like Elvis. To oh, me. He sings like Elvis. You saw him on the show. They were calling him, you know, uh, uh, Elvis of 2000 and whatever that was, 10 or whatever it was that year. So, he yeah. would have been great. He, he now sings with after Queen. He's done with Queen so. Yeah, Queen. Yeah. What a gig. I mean, Queen. I mean, okay. With surgery, he can be Elvis. <laughs> Yeah. Kathy, then, I think we have to get off or you're not going to be able to get the next people on. That's right. right. Let's go. Yeah. We're going to go. And it's time for the Pulp with Queen Awards. So thank you, Marilyn. And oh, thank you, Kathy. Thanks for everything you do. I'm really excited. Uh, we'll see you in just a minute. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.